I want to try and answer at least one question this week. And the one question is a question that has troubled historians for a while. So the answer which we're going to give is going to simply be an attempt to answer the question. And we'll see how it works. We'll see how it feels and how it fits. The question is like this. So we've been covering Jewish mysticism from the earliest periods, from the Tanakh, from the biblical sources, particularly in the book of Ezekiel, Yechaskel. We covered the Jewish mysticism throughout the Second Temple period, through the story of the Hechalot and the Merkava, all that mysticism, which we're not going to repeat. If you need a summary, please do watch the first video. But something happens, interestingly, in the sketch of Jewish mysticism, which is that from the Second Temple, from the end of the Hechalot literature in the Talmud, from the very brief mentions of mysticism which we have, which don't really have all of the full body of Kabbalah as such, which is why academically we don't refer to those periods as Kabbalah proper. We refer to them as early Jewish mysticism. We don't yet have clear, the clear delineation of the concepts which are definitive of Kabbalah, such as the Ten Sfirot, the Four Worlds, the Five Levels of the Soul. Something happens in the 12th century, which is a long time after the Talmudic period. Just to give a frame of reference, the temple is destroyed in the year 70 CE of the Common Era. The Mishnah is codified, is written down in about the year 200 by Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince. About 300 years later, the Talmud is codified in the year 500 CE. This is just a, a general sketch. And from the end of the Talmud being codified from the year 500, what we have is the period of the Geonim moving forward through the period. And in about the 11, 1200s, we have what's called the period of the Rishonim. This is just the way that we have a general rabbinic periodization of history. And in this whole period, in the whole Gaonic period, from about the year 500 till about the year 10, 1100, we don't really have much expression of Jewish mysticism. Something happens in about the year 11, 1200, during what's known as the period of the Rishonim. And I'll, I'll repeat these periodizations. I just want to lay out the mystery here, but I'll go back and repeat what the exact frame and time frame here is. Don't worry. Something happens in the 11th, 12th century where Kabbalah as we know it today is born. Which means the Sfirot, primarily, predominantly the Sfirot, which are seen as the core conceptual bedrock of Kabbalah, comes to its full expression and fruition in the 11th, 12th century in Provence, south of, south of France. So that, that is the question. The question is, what happens in the 12th and 11th century that Kabbalah as we know it today begins? I just want to clarify the periods because I just ran over a lot of periodization. But just to give people a sense of Jewish history as it's understood in rabbinic literature. Jewish history is split up in rabbinic periodizations that begin with the Tanaim, the sages of the Mishnah, who begin to discuss the ideas which become written down in the Mishnah during the time of the Second Temple, before the turn of the millennia. Their works are continually debated. The great sages, Rabbi Kiva, or Hilla, or Meir, are finally written down in the year 200 of the Common Era. These are pretty simple dates to remember. From the writing of the Mishnah, for the next 300 years, the Mishnah is debated, and that gets written down as the Gemara. The two of them together are the Talmud. That happens in about the year 500. Again, a pretty simple date to remember. From the year 500 till about the year, till about the, till about 500 years later, is known as the period of the Geonim. The Geonim are the heads of the academy living in Babylon, and they explain and elucidate and make clear what happened in the Talmud. Does that, is that, is that periodization pretty, it's a pretty fair, simple periodization? Good. What happens in the 10th, 11th century, we have now a new period, the end of the Geonim, the end of the, of the sages of the Talmudic Academies, the, the geniuses, literally. And we have the period of the Rishonim. For anyone who knows basic Jewish history, these terms will be familiar. The Rishonim are the people who begin to, to take the works of the Talmud, the works of the Geonim. The Geonim were really more just cleaning up the Talmud and, and setting in the, the notes for the Talmud. The Rishonim are the next great sages who begin to make new works that begin to codify what happened in the Talmud. Epi Rambam, Rashi, Tosfat, Rambam, these are all the great Rishonim that we know today. In terms of Jewish mysticism, 
just so that we're not doing a complete injustice to the Gaonic period, because we just said that we don't really have Kabbalah during the Gaonic period, we do have some works of, of piety and mystical literature. Most famous is Rabbeinu Bachya. Bachya ibn Pekude writes a book called Chavot HaLevavot, The Duties of the Heart. And in that book, Bachya begins to ask questions about what is the purpose of the mitzvot, what happens internally, what is the work upon the heart, uh, not just the external works. And Bachya lives from the year 1050 to 1120. But besides for some select texts like Bachya's work, we don't really have much of an expression of Jewish mystical or paetical literature. Something happens in the 11th to 12th century, as we've said, where we have an explosion and I'm going to speak about who is the explosion, what's written down, but I want to know what happens in that moment. Is, is, the, is the question that we're trying to answer clear? Is the mystery clear? Can we get some thumbs up, some nods? Good, Pe people understand what the question is? Very good. So we have, we have a expression of Jewish mysticism around the turn of the millennia, second temple period, Merkava, Teichala, and then we have basically radio silence for a long while, until the 11th and 12th century, and over there we have an explosion of Kabbalah as we know it today. Kabbalah is something new happens in the expression of Kabbalah, so it seems. And the question is why that is. This is how we're going to frame the problem and how we're going to get to a solution. There is a literary genre of Jewish mysticism. Jew mysticism can be written in many ways. People can write mysticism in poetry, people can write it in metaphor, people can write it in, in theory. Jewish mysticism is written in one genre, up until the 12th century, which is Midrash. Midrash means, literally, it comes from the Hebrew word Doresh, or Lidrosh, to explore, to excavate, to question, to dig in. Drisha, it is a form of what's known in, in the academic language. It's a form of exegetical practice. It's a hermeneutical practice. It's a term where we turn to a text, and we dig apart the text, and we ask questions, and we find out things. We investigate the text to learn new things. That is Midrash. Midrash is split into two categories. There is Midrash Agadata and Midrash Halacha. Midrash Halacha is the principles of extracting law from the Torah, from the Chumash specifically. There are typically 13 principles of Rabbi Ishmael. There are other systems as well, but for all intents and purposes, that is one of the systems. And then there's a system called Midrash Agadata, where we do the same thing, but we're not extracting law from Torah. We're extracting morals and values and principles and stories and ethics. Anyone who has learnt any Talmud will know that within the same Talmudic passage, we have mixed in all forms of Midrash. Midrash Halakha, Midrash Agadata, and Agada or Agadata, different terms for it, is one of the bedrocks of Jewish literature, and Jewish mysticism is written exclusively up until the period of the Rishonim in the genre of Agadata. Is that, is that understandable? That's a fair point? Okay. And another, by the way, another term for Agadotah, we can call it the mythos of Judaism. Judaism has, if we, if, if we, want, to, if we want to call it a, a mythology, not, to, not mythology in the sense of saying that's not true, mythology as in truth told in the form of a story, Agadotah is the mythos, the mythology of Judaism. Now, what happens in the 12th century is, we have the mythos of Judaism, the Agadot of Judaism, encounters another force, another historical intellectual force, which the contrast of mythos in intellectual history, if anyone has studied the classics, the Greeks, what happens in Greece with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle is that mythos meets logos. Mythos, which is truth in the form of story, meets logos. Logos literally means the spoken word, but it means it's no longer a narrative truth, it's a spoken truth. It's a truth which is systematic, a truth which is made clear, a, tr a truth which is syllogistic, a truth which we know in the form of propositions, scholiums, axioms, this is what Logos is. What happens, in my estimation, and I want to flesh this out with you and, and talk about exactly how this happens and what it means, is that in Jewish thought and in Jewish literature historically, there is a turning point in the 12th century, in the 1100s, where Jewish mythos meets Jewish logos. Where Jewish story, where Jewish agadata meets Jewish philosophy, meets Chakira. 
okay? If I'm going too fast, please tell me to rein it back. The meeting of Agadita with Hakira, the meeting of Mythos with Logos in the 12th century. By raise of hands, who here has heard of Neoplatonism? Because this is an important part of the story. We have one raised hand. Okay, I'm going to explain what Neoplatonism is because I think that we cannot understand this meeting, this, this meeting of these two oceans of Jewish story and Jewish philosophy if we don't understand Neoplatonism, which is one of the backbones, one of, one of the spines of Jewish philosophy, along with its counterpart, and along with its competitor, often Aristotelianism. So let's talk about Plato and Aristotle. I'm guessing that many people who came to a Kabbalah class did not assume that we'd be talking about Plato and Aristotle, but I think to properly, properly understand the philosophical history of Kabbalah, we need to go back to Plato and Aristotle and see how they make it in to Jewish thought and where that meets Kabbalah and what happens with that. And feel free to disagree, this is just my hypothesis. So, a bit of Greek history. We have many what's known as pre-Socratic thinkers, philosophers, Thales, Parmenides, but what happens is there's a certain turn in Greek philosophy with Socrates. Socrates develops what's known as the Socratic method, the way in which we ask questions to get to certain truths, to question our presuppositions. Socrates has a student by the name of Plato. Plato has a student by the name of Aristotle, and these three individuals are the birth of Western philosophy, of Western thinking as we know it, the birth of democracy, the birth of logic, the birth of science, the birth of many good things that we have in the West come from these three men. Now, we don't know much about Socrates himself because all we know is what Plato writes about Socrates in his dialogues, uh, particularly in the Republic and in Timaeus, but we know a lot about Plato and Aristotle. And Plato and Aristotle give birth to two streams of thought. Aristotle, the student of Plato, studies with him in the academy for 20 years until Plato dies. When Plato dies, Aristotle sets up his own learning in the Lyceum, and he doesn't agree with his teacher on all points. And they give birth to two schools of philosophy. And there are many points that emerge from Plato and Aristotle. There are many points of political philosophy, of aesthetics, of epistemology, which we're not going to be looking at. I want to look at what's important for Kabbalah, which is their metaphysics. The metaphysics of Plato and Aristotle, as they are understood later in Jewish history, have a very important part of the story of Kabbalah, and therefore we're going to have to explain them a little. Plato, uh, for anyone who's read The Republic, or anyone who's, who's read The Allegory of the, of the Cave, or anyone who has watched uh, The Matrix or modern retellings of Plato's Allegory of the Cave knows that Plato believed in the theory of the forms. The forms are, Plato says, is that we have all kinds of things in this world, we have tables and chairs and humans and animals and shapes, but all of those things are simply shadows of their true forms or their true selves in some higher realm in the realm of the forms. And I'm not going to get into the nuances of Platonic philosophy. We're going to leave that for classes on Plato and for Plato scholars. We're simply concerned in one point here, which is going to be relevant to Jewish history. Plato has the idea of these forms, these objects that are abstracted, and as we climb up the, the forms, we get to more reified, more pure versions of the forms until we come to the ultimate form, which he calls the one, which is sort of the god in a philosophical sense of Plato. Aristotle disagrees with Plato and says, no, forms are only found in their instantiations in reality. There are no abstract separate forms from reality. And they give birth essentially to two schools of philosophy. Plato's school gets taken up by a group of thinkers, which we now call the Neoplatonists, through, by the way, the work of a Jewish thinker, a Jewish philosopher, by the name of Philo of Alexandria. Philo of Alexandria lives in the years, at the turn of the millennium, he lives from 20 BCE to 50 CE, over the turn of the millennia. A figure, by the way, that's been very much ignored in, in Jewish history and Jewish history philosophy. When we talk about history of Jewish philosophy, we speak about the first Jewish philosopher typically as Sajagon. Sajigarin, who writes the book Amunus Fideus, one of the, one of the Ge'onim, which we mentioned the Ge'onic period before. But if we're going to be honest, Sajigarin is very far from the first Jewish philosopher. Sajigarin is living in the 700s. Uh, Philo is living at the turn of the millennia before the year zero. Um, and although not a rabbinic character, he's an important Jewish philosopher. And Philo is, is typically seated in what's the period that's known as Middle Platonism, followed by Plotinus in the year 204 to 2. 70s when he dies, and Plotinus takes the school of 
Plato, and he makes something which we now know as Neoplatonism, where he kind of leaves out the political theory and all the other theory which he doesn't, he's not so interested. Plotinus is a religious thinker, he's a mystic, and he wants to know about this highest form, about this form which he calls the One, Hen in Greek, and how one can unite with the One. And Plotinus believes that all of reality emerges from the One, from this primordial form, and flows into creation, it emanates, it overflows into reality. Through different, what's known as hyperstasis, through different forms, there is originally the nous, N-O-U-S in Greek, which is the mind, then there is the world soul, and then there is the world matter as we know it, and this is basically the Neoplatonic system. And what happens is, what happens is, as it pertains to Jewish philosophy, these two schools of thinking, the Neoplatonic, taking after Plotinus and Plato, and the Aristotelian enter into Western thought in general, into Jewish, Muslim, and Christian thought. Now, they enter first really by being translated from the Greek into the Arabic by people like Al-Kindi, who was born in the year 800, and then taken up more seriously by Muslim philosophers like Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and later Ibn Arabi. And in their schools of Kalam, which is schools of Muslim philosophy, Kalam literally means the word, again, Logos, the same word in Arabic, they begin to translate these words into Arabic, and Jewish philosophers who are living in Arabic countries, people like Sajigun, people like Rabbeinu Bakr, people like Ibn Gabriel, are interacting with and in conversation with their Muslim counterparts, with their Muslim philosophers. And what they begin to do is they begin to take ideas from Neoplatonism and begin to express Jewish ideas through the language of their own day, which is Neoplatonism. Now, this may seem very bizarre, and we may ask, why are these Jewish thinkers, these rabbis, using some Greek form? But think about this. When Rabbi Ashi gets up in Shul and he gives a drush in the parcha, what language is, Ashi, is Rabbi Ashi speaking? Rabbi Ashi is speaking in English. He's not speaking in Yiddish. He's not speaking in Hebrew. He's using the lingua franca, the language you understand. And the words that Rabbi Ashi is using are words from that language. When Rabbi Ashi speaks about God, speaks about prayer, speaks about acts of goodness and kindness, Rabbi Ashi, by using the contemporary language or any rabbi alive today, is somehow interacting with the thinking and the systems of thought that are built into those linguistic systems. One cannot use a language without tapping into those linguistic motifs and what lies, the idea that lies behind the language. So it would be very nice to believe that we can have some very pure, uncontaminated form of expression, but it's not possible as humans, when we speak and when we communicate, we are contaminated by interaction and sometimes that is good and sometimes that is bad, but that is just a reality. And what happens is that Jewish thinkers begin to express their ideas in Neoplatonic language. There are other Jewish thinkers, most famously Maimonides, who shun much of Neoplatonism and instead turn to forms of Aristotelianism. There's a bit of a tricky part of this history because there's a very famous text called The Theology of Aristotle, which many thinkers thought was Aristotelian, but was really a translation from the Enneads, which is a work from Plotinus. But as far as, they, as far as they knew, they were pure Aristotelians, people like Maimonides, who was an Aristotelian. And then we have people that were the Neoplatonists, most famously people like Ibn Gabriel, whose dates were 1021 to 1070, and preceded a bit earlier by people like Isaac Israeli from 832 to 932. And these people are taking ideas from Neoplatonism and bringing it into Jewish mysticism. Let me explain how that happens in my, in my understanding. Let, let me introduce you to a Jewish thinker by the name of Ibn Gabriel. Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Gabriel writes a book in the 11th century called Mekur Chaim, Source of Life, Fons Vitae in Latin. This book is lost in the original Hebrew, but translated into Latin as Fons Vitae. And it is not a religious text. It is a philosophical text where he explains his understanding of reality, of Neo, which is a Neoplatonistic worldview, although it's very much changed and nuanced because he's a Jewish thinker. The main change that happens in the ideas of Ibn Gabriel is that he replaces the original emanation from the one, from God, where the Greeks said the original emanation was thought, was chachma, was naus. He says the original emanation is will, is ratzon which we'll see later becomes Keter in the Kabbalistic system in the parallel of that. Ibn Gabriel, and this is a very fascinating story. Ibn Gabriel writes this book. It's translated into Latin. 
And for hundreds of years, Ibn Gabriel's work, the Fons Vitae, is the textbook of Neoplatonism for the Middle Ages. If anyone wants to study Neoplatonism, they turn to Ibn Gabriel, to Fons Vitae, and that is where they're studying. That is the book that is given out in colleges and in high schools, so to say. Now, for many hundreds of years, we did not know who the author of Fons Vitae was. The Christian said it was a Christian. The Muslim said it was a Muslim. And the Jew said, of course, it was a Jew. A Vistabral was the name that was given to it, some Latinized name, and no one knew what it was Latinized from. In the year 1846, a scholar by the name of Solomon Monk was digging up manuscripts in the French National Library. And he found a text from another Jewish philosopher, Ibn Falquera, who references Mekur Chaim from Ibn Gabriel, Fond Vite, Mekur Chaim, and he says who the author is, Shalom Ibn Gabriel. And it becomes established that the author is a Jewish author, a Jewish philosopher by the name of Ibn Gabriel. And Ibn Gabriel retrospectively becomes the most important G Jewish Neoplatonist in Jewish history. Ibn Gabriel, we can set up in contrast to Maimonides. Maimonides, who is the arch Aristotelian, versus Ibn Gabriel, who is the arch Neoplatonist. And one way of understanding all the history of all of Jewish philosophy, Chakir, as it's known, is a battle between these two streams of thought up until the modern period between the Neoplatonists represented by Ibn Gabriel and the Ashtotelians presented by Rambam. What does all of this have to do with Kabbalah though, you're asking? This is a very nice introduction to history of Jewish philosophy and Western philosophy, but what does this have to do with Kabbalah? So this is, I believe, the crux of the mystery and where we're gonna solve the mystery. What happens is that in the south of France, in the 12th century, there is a group of scholars who are studying Jewish mysticism. They're studying the Maise Merkava, they're studying the Hechalot, all the things we mentioned in class one. And in addition to that, they're studying the Jewish Neoplatonists, people like Ibn Gabriel. And they see that if they take ideas from Ibn Gabriel, if they use the terms of Ibn Gabriel, they can express and elucidate what they've been trying to say all along in Kabbalistic language with much greater clarity. And what they do is they combine the Medrash, the mythos of Kabbalah, with the logos, with the hakir, with the philosophy of people like Ibn Gabriel. And what they do is that they create a system of thought, which we now call Kabbalah. Just to repeat this point again, Kabbalah in a very broad sense includes everything we spoke about in class one, but in an academic sense, Kabbalah is what we're gonna to begin to talk about now. And this is what happens when people like the Ravid and his son-in-law and his grandson meet the Jewish Neoplatonists. And I'm gonna explain what happens there. Is everyone with me so far? Does anything need to be repeated or clarified? Is that clear? So let me just explain a bit of the system of Neoplatonism, a bit of the metaphysics of Neoplatonism to understand how it marries so beautifully with the Kabbalistic Midrash, which then gives us the birth in the 12th century of the Kabbalah. And then we're going to, then we're going to explain who these Kabbalists are, what the major texts they write, what the major innovations they make are. But let me just give you a brief touch of what Neoplatonism is. The very basic idea of Neoplatonism is, and you'll see automatically why this makes sense for the Kabbalists to use this language is, that reality as we see it today, we see multiplicity, we see diversity, we see bifurcation, we see me and him, us and them, this and that. We see all sorts of, there's a, there's a, there's a fragmentation to reality. Things are broken up, things are separate. The, the, the Neoplatonists say, as, along with the mystics of all of the world, that that brokenness of reality, that fragmentation, that, that separation, that disharmony of reality is just an illusion. It's just like the poor prisoners who are sitting in the, play, in the cave of Plato in the Republic, who only see shadows. And if they turn back and saw the real reality, if they turn back and saw the forms, if they saw the sun, they'd see that all of reality is one is united, is unified. And it is unified in the metaphor of Plato in the sun. The sun is the one object which unifies everything. It is the, it is the king of all forms. And according to Nate, later thinkers, according to the Platonists, according to Plotinus, it is unified in God. God is one. God is one and indivisible. And the indivisibility of God includes the rest of existence. There is nothing outside of God. There is nothing but God. And therefore, if God is one, and there is nothing but God, that means everything is fundamentally one. And any separation, any multiplicity, any distraction, any diversion from that unity is simply some sort of illusion, and which we'll speak about 
But then how do we then get this reality of multiplicity? How do we then have that? So the Neoplatonists teach us that the one overflows into reality and it creates an illusion of separation and multiplicity. And we're going to see these ideas more clearly expressed in Kabbalistic systems. But the impetus for this metaphysics, what happens is, I believe, is that these mystics, this isn't just some theoretical abstract um, you know, positing of some unity and then trying to make sense of it with some multiplicity, but the mystics experience oneness. The mystical experience that is experienced by humans across time, across millennia, across country, is an experience of a fundamental oneness of being. And I think that we have the capacity still today to experience that. We, experience, we can experience that in very deep levels of meditation, in very deep states of love. People experience that now. This is not a uh, condonance or condemning. People experience that on, on psychedelics. There are all different ways of people to experience the deep oneness of reality. And one, 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 when one experiences the deep oneness of reality, the deep unity of reality, and they're confronted by the multiplicity that they see out there in the world, we need to hypothesize some sort of way that the one relates to the many. The problem of the one and the many becomes the central metaphysical problem for Neoplatonism and for Kabbalah. How does one, how does God, who is unified, who is uncontaminated, who is, who is not broken into parts, how does God express and how does it manifest in this world of the many that we see? And the Kabbalists that are writing in the 11th and 12th century, who I'm going to introduce you to now, find very rich language in their brothers, the Jewish Neoplatonists, to explain this problem of the one and the many. Good? So now we, let's now introduce you to those Kabbalists. So far, so clear? Good. So what we're laying out here is a system in history where the Jewish mythos, where the Jewish story, where the Jewish agadita meets the Jewish philosophy, Jewish hakira in the form of Neoplatonism embodied by people like Ibn Gabriel. Um, and I want to move now into the actual story of the 12th century. And I, we're going to see how far we can get. I'd like to cover perhaps up until the 16th century, but seeing um, in, in, in your mind, ideas move much quicker than they come out of your mouth. So we'll see how far we get. and We won't try to push it too much. Good. I, I just want to mention something that I'm skipping so that we don't have any fanatics coming and sending me uh, angry letters in the mail because we are skipping an important moment in Jewish history. Uh, for all those that know, it is known as the Hatsiri Ashkenaz the German pietists is the literal translation, which is really centered around one family, the Kalenimus family, people like Shmuel HaChassid, Yehuda HaChassid, um, and most famously, uh, Eliezer of Worms, the Rokeach. We're going to skip that moment in history, not because it's not important and not because it's unrelated, but because I, I want to try and, and sort of streamline the storyline here to give you a narrative. And I feel like if we get into Chedi Ashkenaz, we're going to be sort of pulled off the main story. So for all of those who are major diehard fans of the Chassidi Ashkenaz, please forgive me for skipping them for the purposes of this class. We can get back to them another time. Now, I want to move you geographically to the south of France, to Provence, down at the bottom near the Mediterranean. In the south of France, there are a group of Kabbalists, a family. They are, it's a bit confusing because the first three of these sages share the same acronym, the same name, the Rivid. The most important one for our purposes is Rav Avram ben David, who anyone who knows uh, Talmudic literature knows because he was what, the great Talmudic opponent, the great halachic opponent of Maimonides. And it is Avram ben David, the Rivid, who begins to talk about the Sfirot as we know them, the Tree of Life, the system which we discussed in the very, very, very first class. His son, Rabbi Yitzchak Saginar, Rabbi Isaac the Blind, is the very, very first Kabbalist who begins to write down in length what the system of the Sefirot are and how they work. He attributes the tradition to his, to his father and his father-in-law and his grandfather to the earlier rivids of history, but it's really Rabbi Yitzchak Saginar, the first person who begins to take this language and put it into written form for us. Again, a, a historical caveat, there are texts 
which predate this moment in Provence. These texts are definitely Sefer Yetzira comes before this. Sefer Abar here almost certainly comes before this, um, although it is a complex question of how that text is dated. I'm not going to talk right now about the about these two texts, about Sefer Yetzirah, Sefer Yetzirah and Sefer Abayir. We're going to come back and talk about the primary texts, and I'm going to explain to you the role that these texts play, but I want to shelf those for the moment and talk about the characters, the people, the people that make up the story. Reb Yitzchak Saginar begins to write down this system, begins to write down the system of this Sirat as we know them, taking early references from these earlier texts that we mentioned, and begins to lay out a clear structure and clearly the Sirat as we know them today. Sirat as they appeared earlier are used in a more amorphous sense, as Kabbalah and terms of the rest of history are expressed most clearly first in Rabbi Yitzchak Saginar, attributing the tradition to his predecessors to the Raivet predominantly. Now, I spoke about the more positive aspect of, of the history here, that Jewish, that these Kabbalists were borrowing systems and language from their Jewish philosophical brethren, from people that preceded them like Ibn Gabriel, but there is also a reactionary part of the story here, which is the greatest philosopher of Jewish history, hands down, is Maimonides. When we talk about the Jewish history of Jewish philosophy, we talk about pre-Maimonides and post-Maimonides. Jewish philosophy is split in half by Maimonides. Now, the Jewish Kabbalists, and this is kind of the, the alternative theory which is sometimes stressed by historians, that, that as opposed to the system which I, the, the hypothesis that I put forth, which is that the Kabbalists were merging their midrashic, their mythological, their readings with the, with the logos, with the philosophical, with the rational systems of Ibn Gabriel, there is a, there's the other side of this coin, which is, it was a reaction against Maimonides. Why is this? What were they reacting against? And this theory makes, makes, does make sense, and we're going to see why. It makes sense also because, as we mentioned, the Ravid, who is the teacher of Yitzchak Saginar, the very first Kabbalist to write down this right as we know them in Provence, was the Talmudic and Halachic opponent of Maimonides. So we see that there is some historical opposition already here. So this is not a far-fetched claim. What did Maimonides say that was so troubling to these Jewish Kabbalists, to these Jewish thinkers? Firstly, as we mentioned, Maimonides was an Aristotelian. He was a follower of the metaphysics of Aristotle. He writes that himself very clearly. And in his main philosophical work, in Mor Nevochim, he tries to synthesize and make peace between Aristotle and Genesis, simply put, and other aspects of Jewish thought. These Jewish, these Jewish thinkers were Neoplatonists. They were students of people like Ibn Gabriel, who are the philosophical nemeses of the Aristotelians. What did, what did Rambam say that so disturbed these Jewish thinkers? I think it was one thing in particular. Rambam is very aware of the traditions, of the Midrashic traditions of Jewish mysticism, of what we call the Ma'aseh Merkava, the stories of the chariot of Ezekiel, and Ma'aseh Bereshit, the story of the creation that the Kabbalists spoke about. And Maimonides says that we have no Masorah, we have no tradition about these systems. They may have existed in Jewish history, but they are lost to us now. And Maimonides says something which is shocking to the, to the Kabbalists. He says, Ma'aseh Bereshit, is physics in the Aristotelian sense, and Maaseh Merkava is metaphysics in the Aristotelian sense. And Maimonides totally washes his Jewish thinking clear of the Midrashic, Kabbalistic forms which existed before him and after him. Now, this is not to say that there is not room of, that there isn't a place of mysticism in Rambam. There is a Aristotelian form of mysticism which one unites their intellect with the active intellect, which we'll have to talk about in another time, and that plays later into the Kabbalists. The Kabbalists, as much as they reject Maimonides, they also take from Maimonides, and there are some very famous Kabbalists who are starch Maimonideans. People like Abraham of Lafia, one of the great Jewish Kabbalists of history, writes not one, not two, but three commentaries on Mara Nevochim, on the philosophical magnum opus of Maimonides, more than any other human in history, but in these very, very first moments of Jewish philosophy, this claim of Rambam, that we have no Masorah, that the, that the traditions of Maseh Merkava, of Maseh Bereshit, have not been passed down to us in a faithful way, is something which the mystics abhor. 
And even if they were keeping their Masara secret for many years, even if the Hasidi Ashkenaz were not going public with their Masara, it came the time in the eyes of people like the Ravid, the opponent of Maimonides, people like Rabbi Tzach to come out and to begin to express, firstly, yes, we have Masara, and number two, this is what our Masara is. And the language which they use to express the Masara is the language of the Neoplatonists, the philosophical op opponents of Maimonides. So there we have the two sort of competing ideas, and they probably play into one another, both a positive reaction with the birth of Neoplatonism in Jewish thought, and a reaction to Maimonidean Aristotelianism. Was that last point clear? Good, that's clear. So, what happens is, we're going to, to understand what really happens in Kabbalah, we're going to have to move beyond Rabbi Yitzchak Saginar, because Rabbi Yitzchak Saginar is only the very beginning, Rabbi Isaac the Blind is only the very beginning, but he has some very important students. He has some students, one of them is two potentially brothers, although that's not so clear, Azriel and Ezra of Girona, living from the 1160s to about the 1230s, and his nephew, uh, Asher ben David, who lives in the mid-1200s, who writes a Kabbalistic work called Sefer HaYichod, the Book of Unity, and these students migrate from Provence, from south of Spain, across the border, heading down west towards northeast Spain to Girona and to Catalonia. These are not very, very far from one another, they're just uh, a few hundred kilometers over the border, and over there, they pass on their traditions from their teachers to a one of the great, great thinkers in Jewish history, one of the great, great, great Kabbalists, and again, a interlocutor and sometimes opponent of Maimonides, none other than Nachmanides, Ramban in Hebrew. Their names are very similar and sometimes they get confused, but Ramban, ending with a nun, an N, as opposed to Rambam, ending with an M, Maimonides and Nachmanides. Ran Ramban does something which is very, very important. Ramban, whose dates are 1194 to 1270, living in northeast Spain, near the border, Nachmanides does something which is very important, which is that he takes these Kabbalistic traditions that he's receiving from Ezra and Ezreal of Gerona and Asher ben David, it's not so clear exactly who he learns from, but, but these are the things which are put forth, the ideas that are put forth, the potential characters who pass on the tradition to the Ramban. And the Ramban, a major, major thinker in Jewish history, takes Kabbalah and introduces it into his pirush, into his interpretation, into his explanation of the Chumash. The Ramban writes a commentary on Torah, and the Ramban is the first person to take the ideas of Kabbalah and to begin to explain Chumash based on Kabbalah. The reason this is so important is because while not everyone is going to be learning metaphysics and while not everyone is going to be learning Kabbalah, everyone is learning Chumash. And when you take Kabbalah and you put it into Chumash, you have now brought Kabbalah mainstream. And Ramban being a, 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 a giant of Jewish thought, a giant of Halakha, a giant of the revealed aspects of Torah, is a giant of Jewish mysticism. And what happens now is a really transitional moment in the 13th century where Kabbalah is brought mainstream by using it in his interpretation on Chumash and any child, any adult who now learns who now learns Chumash with its commentaries will be learning Kabbalah with Nachmanides, with Ramban. In addition to that, the Ramban has a, has a, a circle of students most famously is the Rashba, Reb Shlomo Ibn Adert who is most famous again as a halachic thinker who writes thousands of halachic responsa, uh, and a student, of Maimonides, a student of Nachmanides who also begins to teach Kabbalah. Uh, other student, another student of, of, of Nachmanides is Isaac of Acre, who travels from Israel to Spain, studies with Nachmanides, and begins as well to write works of Kabbalah. And other characters like Rav Yaakov ben Sheshas, and other characters in that time period. And what happens is, they begin to take these traditions, which were very, which were very hidden and which were very sort of locked away and they begin to make it almost mainstream. Not quite mainstream, I wouldn't exaggerate that it was entirely mainstream, but they're introducing it to texts, talacha, to main works. If you'll notice something interesting, by the way, almost all of these characters in Jewish history, in the history of Jewish mysticism, were great, great halachic minds. Ramban, the, the Rashba, these people were immense, immense ca characters of, Jew of Jewish mysticism and of halacha. 
This is something which is very unique in the history of mysticism in general. We see this as well, people like Rabbi Yosef Kaira, one of the most famous uh, halachic figures in Jewish history, who we'll get to in the 15th, 16th century, is a great, great mystic and Kabbalist. I'll tell you why this is so amazing. Generally, in mysticism, in many traditions, in Sufism, in Christian mysticism, and other forms of mysticism, there is a tension, there's a conflict between the orthodox, standard practice of the traditions and the mystics who feel the need to break out of the, of the molds and the boundaries of orthodoxy. And as we spoke about in class one, the genius of Jewish mysticism is that it is grounded deeply in Jewish practice. And therefore, it is no surprise that in Judaism, although this is a surprise for the rest of the world mysticisms, the greatest Jewish mystics are the greatest halakha characters as well. Because they understand that, that Jewish mysticism is only alive in the practice, in the body of Judaism, in the halakha of Judaism. And the only conduit into Jewish mysticism is through halakha, is through its practice. And this is very important with characters like Ramban and like Rashba, these great halakha characters who we're now exploring. Because many people believe that one can do Jewish mysticism without doing halakha, and this is impossible conceptually, theoretically, practically, and historically. Historically, the greatest Jewish mystics are the greatest Jewish halachists. I want to transition now from 12th, 12th century we spoke about the Ravid, uh, Yitzchak Saginar, 13th century we spoke about Ramban, Rashba. I want to now move towards the end of the 13th century, where, oh, it looks like we're running out of time. I'm getting a, a mention from Jenny. It's coming to 11.55 in my time, which is 10.55 for you. So let me wrap up, say what we've covered, and say perhaps what we'll do next week. I, I want to, next week I want to be begin to move into the end of the 13th century. People like Reb Yosef Jikatilia with his major Kabbalistic work, Shari Era, Menachem Mercanti, an Italian Kabbalist, um, Avram Abulafia, who has a very, very fascinating form of, of a static and prophetic form of Kabbalah, um, Moshe de Leon, a Spanish Kabbalist, who's very, very important for many reasons, which we'll discuss. But let me just summarize briefly what we, what we, what we covered. Uh, we attempted to answer the mystery of why Kabbalah burst forth in the scene in the way that we know it in the 11th and 12th century in Provence, south of Spain, with characters like the Ravid and Reb Yitzchak Saginar. And we hypothesized that it was a meeting of two great ways of Jewish thinking, of the Midrashic mind, of the, the narrative, the story, the exegetical, the, the mind which goes into a text and, and is Doresh and makes all sorts of readings and nuanced readings, the Midrash Agadita, with Chakira, with the Logos, with the philosophical, with the rational, with the systematic, as embodied in the form of Neoplatonism, which was taught to the Kabbalists by people like Ibn Gabriel, who received it in relation with his Muslim philosophers like Al-Kindi and Al-Farabi, who they got it from the Greek thinkers like Plotinus, who got it from a Jewish thinker by the name of Philo of Alexandria, ultimately going back to Plato. And what happens is when these two streams of thought meet, when the rational, systematic, philosophical, and the midrashic, Kabbalistic meet, we have this birth of Kabbalah, as you know, the systematic Kabbalah, with its own order of emanation, its great chain of being, the Seder Hishtal Shalot, the Sfirot, the Alamot, which we will discuss in due time. And that, I hope, solves the mystery in addition to the reaction against Rambam. And we got to cover some of the main figures of Jewish Kabbalah in Provence and, um, and Girona and Catalina in the 12th and 13th century. I hope everything was clear and I would like to open to some questions. If anything that we've said so far has not been clear, needs clarification. Uh, if there are any questions about things that we haven't mentioned, please hold them, please write them down. If there are any questions about things that we said already, now is the time, uh, if Rabbi Ashi could please unmute people to have any questions before we end. So I think if we're gonna have questions, um, either for those who have videos can raise hands, otherwise if you can type on the chat and I'll unmute you. If anyone has any specific questions, uh, just before that, just to say thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Zevi, for trying to cram in a lot of info and historical context into a short period of time and uh, giving us a lot of food for thought. Yasha Koyach, thank you so much. If anyone does have any, any questions, I think it would be interesting, Zevi, if you've ever done a, a talk just exploring more about the... To explain a little bit more in depth the clashes of perspective between the Neoplatonism and the, the Aristotelianism, like those two schools of thought and Definitely. What, 
from a Jewish mystical perspective as to why they are at loggerheads. Uh, you did sort of briefly talk about it, and obviously this isn't the place in this shit to get too much in depth of that, but I think that based on the fact that you use that as a foundation for your, your hypothesis, I think it might be interesting if, if either you've done a video on that or if you know of other videos that you could post on the chat, that people could learn more about that. I'd be, I mean, I'd be one, it'd be interesting to know if anyone has done such a video before to explain the, the differences. Cause obviously the Rivet and the Rambam were at loggerheads as we know, but you're actually using the cause of that loggerheads that the one comes from an Aristotelian background, the other one from, a, from sort of the Neoplatonist background. So it'd be interesting to explore that further in detail. I'm not sure if you, have you ever done that before? Um, no, it's not something which I, which I have done and I've recorded and it's something which is worth exploring and, and there are resources that explore it in a more general context of Aristotelians versus Neoplatonists, but it'll be very interesting to be done in a Jewish context to see what that debate means for Jewish thinkers. Because um, essentially that's the crux of your argument now and it's interesting to, it would be interesting to explore that. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to explain, you know, more essentially how, how Platonism and Aristotelianism differ on theory of the forms, um, how they conceptualize the infinite uh, is, is a crux of the issue, whether infinity can exist in abstraction. So they, they, differ on, they differ on some very interesting metaphysical uh, questions, questions of, I mean, one, one of the big issues for Jewish philosophy is the, infinite, is, is the question of infinity, uh, particularly in relation to the existence of the world. Did the world always exist, or, or did the world begin at a certain point? And obviously for Jewish philosophers, the world beginning at a certain point was very, was very uh, fundamental because we know from, from Bereshit, from Genesis, that God creates the world, which means that the world didn't always exist. And one of the big challenges in uh, Guide to the Perplexed, in Marina Vuchim of Maimonides, is grappling with Aristotle's idea of infinity, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the existence of the world, well, the Rambam, you... said that, the Rambam says that it's not proven the Aristotelian way, but if it was, you'd find a way to work it out right. in the verses. Right. So you could, see, you, could see how, you could see how serious he's taking the Aristotelian notions of infinity in relation to the world, where he would be forced to make it fit with Genesis if he felt that they were more, you know, in the, in the bedrock of Aristotle. He ends up escaping the issue by, by saying that Aristotle himself doesn't have to be read so hard that way. But, but the basic understanding of the way which they conceptualize infinity... Is, is very fundamentally different between the Neoplatonists and the Aristotelians. And I think that that metaphysically, along with their, and, and I think that ties into their, their theory of the forms and the way that the two of them read it differently. And, so and, you, don't really think that of... the, you don't think the spheres and, and the Kabbalistic uh, construct would fit with Rambam's understanding or his perspective, his philosophy? So, see, this is the thing. In Rambam slash Aristotle's theory, you don't, you don't really have... Okay, so it's, it's a very interesting question. To, to have the spheros metaphysically, you need what's known in, in the history of philosophy as a great chain of being. A great chain of being means that you have a principle that sits at the top of the chain, at the top of reality, which is, the, which is ontologically the most real thing, the only real thing really, which flows being, which flows its reality into the rest of reality as we know it. And that creates what's known as a great chain of being. And that's what the Kabbalists call a Seder Stalschluss. That's what the Neoplatonists refer to as their process of, of now, some world soul and matter. Um, and, and Aristotle doesn't, doesn't quite have this. What Aristotle does have, though, which, which allows for a sort of Aristotelian form of great chain of being, although it's not... For the Neoplatonists, this is really central to the, to the, to the system. The Neoplatonists are, are constantly explaining the, 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 the great chain of being. In, in Aristotle, though, you have an idea... Of, of sort of forms of matter. So for example, we know in Jewish philosophy, we have domim tamea chaim We have inanimate, uh, vegetative, animal, and human. Th that fourfold category comes from Aristotle, or at least it's, it's formulized also by Aristotle, depending on how you want to see that. So because we have gradations of being, one can read in an Aristotelian way that that gradation continues all the way up to God. So above the human is the angel, above the angel is, is Srofim and Erfanim and Chais, and you can see in Rambam, Rambam sort of has these gradations from inanimate through the angelic to the divine. So there is a form of Aristotelian slash Maimonidean Seder Hishtalshul's great chain of being, but it doesn't play as central as the role. It's more of a taxonomy of being. It's more, it's more scientific in trying to 
uh, put things in categories than it is in a metaphysical sense of this flowing of, of, of being, of isness, of, of yesh uh, from, from the one all the way till matter and a return that, that things try to return. In Aristotle, ma matter doesn't try to return to the angelic. Matter stays matter and angelic stays angelic. In, in Neoplatonism, the goal is to return to the one, is to become, is to become the one again. Mm. So, I mean, I have to sort of think about that, but Zevi also, like, for example, within the, the Rebbeim, who were, who were, you know, I mean, you look at the Rebbe, who the Rambam was such a central, such a central figure in, in the Rebbe's thinking. So, and, and generally to, you know, so essentially you're having Chassidus, which is based according to what you're saying on the Neoplatonism and, and the Rambam, which is the Tilianism and sort of bridging the two together. I mean, how do we, how do we reconcile yeah. that? Yeah. 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 So, so that's, that's a very interesting, that's a very, very interesting observation. And Rambam, you're right, is, is huge for Chassidus, particularly for Chassidus Chabad. What happens is, what happens is like this. Firstly, the Rambam's Aristotelianism is not pure Aristotelianism. He also has a Neoplatonized Aristotelianism. And this is because many texts historically were attributed to Aristotle, which really belonged to the Neoplatonists. The famous example which I gave during the class was a text that was known as uh, Theology of Aristotle which, as the title suggests, was from Aristotle, but it wasn't. It was a translation of a section of the Enneads, which was a text from Plotinus, the father of Neoplatonism, which was written down by his student Porphyry, who wrote down the Enneads, I believe. Um, so, so, the, so the thinkers who thought that they were being hardcore Aristotelians reading the theology of Aristotle were really had elements of Neoplatonism mixed into them. So these, these sort of clear-cut, you know, surgical separation between Neoplatonism and, Aristotel and Aristotelianism that we can have today in retrospect, the thinkers themselves did not have. That's one point, firstly. Secondly, is that although Maimonides, uh, in his antagonism to Neoplatonism, is an early, perhaps, catalyst for the expression of Kabbalah as it's found, once Maimonides becomes taught and accepted, which takes time, it takes about a hundred years in Jewish thought for Maimonides to become accepted, he is then read by the Kabbalists as one of, as one of their own, by, by many. The most famous example is, is Avram Ablafia. Um, what happens is that, that Maimonides has a form of Aristotelian mysticism, which is that Aristotle has this principle of the active intellect. The Seichel HaPoyl is what, is, what Aristotle, is what Rambam calls it. The active intellect, the Seichel HaPoyl, is a way which they speak about God. The Chachma, like sort of the, the highest sphere for them is one of the ways which they speak about God. In later Jewish theology, this is very complicated. People like the Maharal attack the Rambam for, for calling God Chachma. But Maimonides tip very famously says that God, Hu Hamada, Hu Hayedea, Hu Hayedea, that Maimonides is the knower, the knowing, and the known. Uh, sorry, that God is the knowing, the knower, and the known. Um, and, and according to Maimonides in chapter 51 of the Guide to the Perplexed, Maimonides writes that one can unite with that active intellect one's own seichel, one's own rational soul, the nefesh ha-sichlis, which Ram calls the, the, the human soul, can unite with the divine active intellect, and they, they can become one. Now, it's debated whether he whether this means only after you die or while you're alive, but that's a separate story. But what happens is that the aspects within Rambam, which are mystical, are read back into the Kabbalistic system and into the Neoplatonic system by later Kabbalists. So by the time uh, Hasidic thought comes on the scene, and by the time, by the time Chabad comes in the scene there's already work that's already there's enough work that's been done already for Rambam to no longer be an arch opponent but to be an ally and already want to be read into the system that's interesting it's interesting to think that way and also to think that perhaps it's interesting I, I need to just sort of uh, process a little bit of that and to think about it and how much of it also was the Rambam as you say just borrowing from the Aristotelian framework rather than being bound by the Aristotelian framework as well. Yeah. Yeah, these are, these are complex historical questions. Um, and there's like, it, it, any one of these questions is fraught with, with challenge and with, with, you know, debates. I, I just, what, I, what I've done in the class is I've really just chosen sort of one line of thinking uh, and presented that. If I, if, I, if I get too much into the uh, minutia and, and debates, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bit much uh, for everyone. So... Awesome. Thank you, Zevi. Does anyone else uh, have any other uh, thoughts that they want to end off with? Any comments? Anything you want to share?
Okay, so I just want to thank Zevi for giving us of his time, for giving us a lot to think about, and we look forward to continuing the conversation, the discussion uh, next week, Sunday morning. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Have a beautiful week. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep on learning, keep on discussing, keep on thinking. And we shall connect again very soon. And, and Denise and Maya say thank you for the most interesting session. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful Sunday.